Well, we've been looking the last several weeks at the way of Jesus, the way of Jesus Christ, the completely different than all the other ways way of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ. You guys know Christ isn't really his last name. I've got friends who think that. No, Christ is his title, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. That's what the scriptures tell us. He is the full revelation of who God is, God in the flesh. We've been looking at the way of Jesus. We've looked at the Old Testament, the ancient Hebrew scripture. Specifically, we looked at the way of Abraham. We looked at the way of Moses. We looked at the way of David. And we've, we've looked at how each of those ways really inevitably point us to the way of Jesus, the way God has revealed himself through Jesus. We've jumped the last couple weeks into some history. Uh, the first century, the time of Jesus' birth, Christmas time, but also the time of his life, his, his teachings and his miracles, his death and resurrection. And we've compared and contrasted the unique way of Jesus with the way of Herod the Great. We did that a couple weeks ago. We've the Jewish king. We've also compared and contrasted the way of Jesus with the way of Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest. Today we're going to finish our teaching series and take a hard look at a historian named Josephus. Josephus. He was born seven years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, his name doesn't show up anywhere in the Bible, so maybe, maybe some of us are at least less familiar with Josephus than we are with Herod, uh, who we hear a lot about around Christmas time, or Caiaphas later in Jesus' life. But we're going to discover together today that Josephus is a major, major figure in history. Josephus, like I said, born seven years after the crucifixion, he grew up in a world where Peter was the lead pastor and the teacher of the first Christians. Josephus grew up in a world where Paul was, was the, the traveling church starter all over the Mediterranean. He started new churches with new Christians. And so while Paul was, was still busy writing letters to all these churches about what it means to live the way of Jesus, Josephus was busy working on diplomacy and, and military arrangements between the Jews and the Romans. That was his job. While the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were being circulated among all these scattered Christians late in Josephus' life, Josephus was simultaneously writing volumes of history books, which we have to this day. While the early church was struggling to find its way, Josephus was accomplishing things. He was climbing the ladder. Josephus lived in Palestine for the first half of his life, among the Jews, among his own people. And then the second half of his life, this is unique for back then, he lived in Rome, along with the Romans. Now, I know we've tackled a lot of history lately. I have no idea if, if a lot of you have been bored out of your mind. Um, I've turned into history teacher here at the church. I hope a lot of you have found this interesting, even more than interesting. I hope it's helpful as we just try to navigate, what's it mean to follow Jesus in 2020? What's it mean to follow Jesus here on the other side of the planet now? Historical context can be, can be really helpful to look back at the scriptures and go, oh, that's what that means. Oh, that's how I can apply that to my life. Josephus actually grew up really religious. He studied hard as a teenager, and he decided, I want to explore all my options. So he looked at becoming a Pharisee. He looked at becoming a Sadducee. He looked at becoming an Essene, a different group we haven't talked about. He even went out into the desert as a teenager. I think he was about 16 for three years and lived with a hermit, a spiritual mentor, just to try to, is this the way I should go? Ultimately, as a, an old teenager at around the age 19, he decided to become a Pharisee. We've talked a lot about what Pharisees are. Later, when he started writing his books, he mentioned a few folks that are very familiar to us. He mentions John the Baptist in his history books. He mentions Jesus himself, uh, one of those non-biblical uh, writings that gives credence to the life of Jesus. And he mentions James. But there isn't any evidence that Josephus took Christianity seriously at all. I think it's, I think it's interesting to me that he tried out Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, this desert life, and he, he didn't explore, as far as we know, this new movement of Christianity. Well, one of the more important things for us to understand, looking back 2,000 years later, is revolution was in the air. Uh, specifically, 
uh, violent revolution, armed revolution. That was what was going on all around. More and more, the Jews were getting tired of the Romans occupying their space and ruling over them. I don't think we can fully appreciate this. Can you imagine if we lived here in Texas and, I mean, I can't even, it sounds crazy to say, but the Koreans had military bases here or the Chinese had military bases here and they were ruling us and taxing us. So it was Texas, but not more, not anymore, not really. Uh, I don't know how long that would last before we would just go crazy. This is what was going on in first century Palestine. More and more Jews wanted to get rid of the Romans by force. Different groups were popping up everywhere, different sectarian groups. A common name for these different groups was the Zealots. It was a generic name for, for a bunch of different extreme groups. But it was also often referring to a particular party. So sometimes you read about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and the Zealots. It's, it's a party that some people belong to. Today, when we look at it, it's anyone and everyone who is ready to violently get rid of Rome. When we look back now, a couple thousand years later, and we talk about zealots, it's just this big group of people. Maybe they had a lot of small groups inside that big category, but there were anybody, everybody who wanted to get rid of Rome violently. We do know that Jesus had at least one zealot in his first 12 disciples. Um, not Simon Peter, but the other Simon. Uh, we don't know much about him except that he was referred to as Simon the Zealot. Uh, we also uh, know from some scholars that speculate Judas Iscariot, the one who ended up betraying Jesus, that he might have been tied to the Sicarii, which is one of the Zealot groups. We don't know that for sure. So maybe this is helpful to us when we see how Jesus was often confused with the Zealots of his day. Jesus was from Galilee. He was from this region of the country where there was actually a, a really big zealot stronghold. And Jesus was constantly talking about a new kingdom. He was constantly talking about overthrowing the kingdom of this world. He sounded like a zealot when he talked. Of course, for anyone and everyone who followed Jesus, uh, they discovered he was not a zealot at all who wanted to violently get rid of Rome. What did, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus model? He blessed the poor in spirit. Remember, Jesus commanded his followers to love their enemies. Talk about an anti-zealot approach, right? Jesus approved paying taxes to the Roman emperor. Also, not anything the zealots wanted to be a part of. Jesus assembled a bunch of people who would be of absolutely no use in a war. <laughs> a bunch of women and children and meek and, and uh, weak and sick people that would come together and, and this crowd that grew to follow Jesus, if you just took one look, you're like, yeah, that is not a threatening group. <laughs> There's reasons why we just could see pretty quickly, oh, this is not a zealot group. Paul wrote to the first Christians in Corinth, in one of his letters, he said, remember, dear brothers and sisters, he says, do you remember that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you? You remember the motley crew you were? I mean, this was like a, a ragtag group that started following Jesus. If you stuck around Jesus long enough, you discover he was no zealot. The biggest proof was that Jesus was not a zealot is after the execution, after this crucifixion on that fateful Friday, there was no revolt. There was no uprising. There was no looting. There was no violence. There was no killing it was very quiet. Let's go back to Josephus for a minute. This guy was sharp. He was ambitious. Uh, after educating himself largely on his own, he climbed the ladder amongst his peers. And then in his mid-20s, this is pretty young for what he pulled off, he was picked by the Jewish leaders to travel off to Rome. He'd never been to Rome yet, but he was picked to travel off to Rome and negotiate the release of some Jewish priests who had been arrested by the Romans and carted off to Rome. So he gets, this is a pretty important mission. He gets sent off to Rome. And evidently on this, on this big trip, Josephus, who was already noticed and respected by a lot of the Jewish leadership, began to be noticed and respected by the Roman leadership. We can even read how he became friends with the wife of the emperor, Nero. So Josephus was a charmer. He was sharp. He was ambitious. Here's some more context for us. 
at the same time that Paul, that we're, we're a lot more familiar with as the leader of the Christians along with Peter, at the same time Paul was in prison in Rome, he's about to be killed by the emperor Nero. At the exact same time, Josephus is in Rome pleading with the Roman government, the emperor Nero, to let his Jewish priest friends come home. So fast forward. Paul dies. Paul's buried. He's gone. Josephus goes back to Palestine where more and more zealot violence is happening. And Rome is sending more and more troops down to Palestine. At the age of 29, Josephus was appointed by the Jewish council as the governor general of Galilee to deal with this, this growing tension between the Jews and between the Romans. He ends up raising an army of like 100,000 men. Let me sum up what happened next. There's a lot more history. I just want to sum this up. A lot of fighting and a lot of death. That's the summary. A lot of fighting, a lot of death. In the tens of thousands, we know at least 40,000 died in one particular battle. And Josephus was helping to head up the Jewish forces. And then in one day, one day, Josephus goes from hero to villain. In one day, 37 years after Judas betrayed Jesus to the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem, Josephus betrayed his Jewish country to Rome. In one instant, he went from brightest and best of the Jews to most famous traitor. As Christians, who do we think of when it comes to being a traitor? We think of Judas, right, who betrayed Jesus that night in the garden and led to his torture and his execution. As Americans, who do we think of when it comes to being a traitor? Benedict Arnold comes to mind. Well, the Jews, they have Josephus. Check out what he did. There was a battle ending in the Galilean city of Jetapada, and the Jews overrun, and the city was burned to the ground, and Josephus hid in a cave with about 40 Jews. So picture this, jo Josephus and about 40 of them hiding. Everything's been destroyed. After three days of hiding, they're found. General Vespasian, who's, who's the head of the, the Roman forces, finds Josephus, and he's telling them basically, if you come out of the cave, we'll guarantee you safety. We'll, we'll spare your life if you'll come out. Well, the 40 Jews decided that it would be dishonorable to surrender. It would be dishonorable to give themselves up. They decided to be more honorable to commit suicide. Well, Josephus did not want to die. And so he was quick with words. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's way more honorable to die than it is to kill ourselves. So how about we, this is what we'll do. We'll cast lots. We'll like draw names out of a hat. And um, each person will kill the next person all the way down to when there's two left and one will kill the last one and then kill themselves. So we'll have 40 deaths that are honorable and just one suicide. And they bought it. And Josephus manipulates it to where he goes last. You know where I'm going with this. And it comes down to the last two. They've killed all these other folks. It comes down to the last two and he convinces the other one, hey, let's just give ourselves up. And they go out to the Roman forces. And pretty quickly, Josephus goes to leading the Jewish forces to prisoner in Rome, to servant of General Vespasian. He just works himself into a leadership role with the Romans. The Romans would end up sending Josephus back to Jerusalem more than once to plead with his fellow Jews to submit to Rome. And he would do it. This is how far he sold out. He would say to his own people, Rome only wants what's best for you. Save what is left to be saved. And the Jewish people hated him for it. They hated him. In 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem and the Holy Temple were leveled to the ground, just as Jesus had said was going to happen. For the next 30 years, Josephus wrote a ton of books mostly communicating this central message to the Jews that they ne needed to give up being so Jewish. To sum it all up as we look at the life of Josephus, he was a self-serving opportunist. He was a Jew when it was advantageous to be a Jew. He was a Roman when it was advantageous to be a Roman. He was an opportunist. His, his life was all about himself, all about Josephus, 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 Josephus. 
deny yourself, the words of Jesus, not even in his vocabulary. I think it's important for us to have this context as we understand the, the early movement of Christianity. After Jesus was crucified, this small new movement of Christians, what happened to them? They were mocked. Some of them were arrested. Some of them were put in prison. We can read in Acts chapter 5 how Peter and John were brought before Caiaphas, the high priest, for questioning the same Caiaphas who had earlier arranged the crucifixion of Jesus. Excuse me, that's Acts chapter 4. And then in Acts chapter 5, we read about an angel freeing Peter and John from jail. In Acts chapter 7, we read about Stephen, who was one of the first deacons, another role we have here at our church called deacons. It's a servant of the church. We read about Stephen, one of the first deacons. He got stoned to death. And then more and more Christians were hunted down and killed in that first century. The revolutionary violence only increased, only accelerated. Violence against the Romans, violence against the Sadducees who led the Jews, violence against the Christians. And how did Rome respond to all this violence? More violence. They send in more troops. They, they send in more orders to take people out, which makes this, in my opinion, very important for us to notice. The way of Jesus did not include violence. There isn't a single recorded instance of violence by any of Jesus' followers. The closest thing we can find is when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus the night before his death. Matthew records it. One of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword. We know it's Peter, by the way, because John also recorded this event. Peter pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Jesus told Peter to chill out, and then he healed the guy's ears. That's all we have about any violence. And this is especially amazing to me because there was so much revolutionary violence going around at this time all around them, all of it for religious reasons. The Jews served a jealous God. That's what the Hebrew Scripture tells us. God is a jealous God. They were jealous for their God. The Jews were part of a long tradition of holy wars, Abraham freeing Lot, Moses leading the exodus out of Egypt, Joshua conquering the land of Canaan, David killing all the Philistines, the Maccabees in guerrilla warfare against the Greeks. And then you come all the way to the first century and you have all these zealot groups that are looking for any chance they can to fight the Romans. This was all religious fighting, fighting on God's behalf against, in this case, the Romans and their false gods and their loose morality that was invading their world. And yet the first followers of Jesus didn't kill. They didn't use violence, even though it would have been the most natural thing to do, the most understood, maybe even the most appealing thing to do. Why didn't they? Well, the first Christians followed Jesus. And Jesus, who was now living in them, wasn't killing anyone. If we're going to follow our leader, if we're going to do what our leader does, that's what they did. Josephus, the historian, he, he describes five revolutionary zealot groups. There's actually as many as 24 listed in history, but, but he really goes into detail on five revolutionary zealot groups. First of all, there's the Sicarii. And, and like I said before, maybe Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, had links to Sicarii. Maybe he didn't, but that was a zealot group. He also writes of the Zealots. That's just this official party called the Zealots. He writes of the bandits of John of Gashala. He writes of the lower class force of Simon Bar Giora. And he writes of the Edomians. Now, there's two other Zealot groups that are referred to actually in the Bible, in the book of Acts. In chapter 5, we read about the followers of Thetis. And in chapter 21, we read about the 4,000 assassins. I would like to know more about the 4,000 assassins. Now, will any of this be on the test? No. You don't have to even pay attention really. I just wanted to give you this picture because the country was overrun by zealot groups. People of all different groups fighting in God's name against the Romans. Again, some helpful context for us as we try to understand Jesus more. For example, 
The gospel writer John, he writes about how badly people wanted a Messiah. They wanted to deliver. They wanted somebody to ride in with a white horse and a big sword and a huge army and wipe out the Romans. One day, they approached Jesus in Jerusalem in the temple, teaching. John chapter 10 says, the people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus replied, I've already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my Father's name. They did not like that answer, because the proof in the work he was doing was healing people and touching the untouchable and hanging out with the scum, they called them. This was the work of the Messiah? They didn't like that answer. Skip down to verse 31. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill Jesus. Violence for God. When I was 14, I got to travel to Israel. Haven't been back since. I always thought I'd go back by now. I, I hope I get to go back in this life. But at 14, I had a ball. I went with my dad. I went with a, a group from our church. And um, it, was, it was incredible. Uh, at 14, I, I, this is a little weird, but it makes sense to me because I was a dude and I was only 14. But of all these amazing things I got to see and, and things right out of the Bible that came to life, you know what my favorite day was, my favorite thing I got to visit? It was the site of the most famous story coming out of this zealot movement. It was Masada. It was this fortress, this massive fortress built by Herod the Great. Uh, right about the time that Josephus defected uh, to the Romans, a group of zealots retreated to Masada on the western shore of the Dead Sea. It's just this giant, giant mountain of a fortress. It was impregnable. Uh, it was so steep, and the, the entry points were so minimal that a few hundred could hold off thousands for a long period of time. But history tells us the Roman general Silva eventually made his way inside the fortress. He finally, just after months of siege, he finally broke through. And you know what he found when he broke through the walls of Masada? Silence. Because what the Roman soldiers found was 960 dead people, dead Jews, dead zealous Jews who had committed suicide. Men, women, and children. They chose to live not even one minute under godless Roman rule. The reason we know a lot about what went on in the days and weeks and months leading up to that was they found two women and five children who had been hiding and escaped that mass suicide to tell them what had happened. This zealous fighting for God was part of the culture of first century Israel. Even the first disciples of Jesus, they had it in the way they thought. In Jesus' last trip to Jerusalem, they were getting poorly treated by the Samaritan people, this neighboring group of people. Luke writes in chapter 9, when James and John, these are two of the disciples, when they saw this, this mistreatment, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? This was just part of their thinking. And Jesus, it says in the scripture, just rebuked them. Jesus just said, no. That's not, that's not my way. Okay, let's shift together today. Let's, let's talk about us. Let's talk about now. Zealotry is alive and well. It's here. It's admired by a lot of people. It's certainly very hard to rid it from the human spirit. It's certainly very hard to rid it from the religious human spirit. When we believe God is on our side, it's so easy to rationalize doing anything we think works, anything that might bring victory, even if it's bullying or it's lying or it's manipulating or it's killing. If the opposition is identified as evil, we can rationalize anything, right? I know I can. Thomas Merton eloquently puts it this way. He says, we must be on our guard against a kind of blind and immature zeal, the zeal of the enthusiast or the zealot, which represents precisely a frantic compensation for the deeply personal qualities which are lacking to us. 
The zealot is man who loses himself in his cause in such a way that he can no longer find himself at all. Yet, paradoxically, this loss of himself is not the salutary self-forgetfulness commanded by Christ. It is rather an immersion in his own willfulness conceived of as the will of an abstract, non-personal force, the force of a project or program. Now, that's a mouthful, but the Christian church has had a long, not-so-good track record with this. We, we can look at our history, the Crusades in Europe, the Inquisition in Spain, the witch burnings in New England, the Cromwell's Re Revolution in England, the conquistadors of Central and South America. We could go on and on. We, we need to remember, lest we think, oh, that's crazy stuff. That's way back then. That's not us. We need to remember that in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus equated killing with our hands with killing with our words. He said, if you've, if you've hated someone, if you've said hateful things about someone, you have murdered. That really lowers the bar right there, doesn't it? Zealotry is alive and well. And Jesus simply rebukes it. He says, no, no, that's not my way. The way of Jesus does not include force. Let that sink in for a little bit. And if that, if that causes some tension, I hope that's some good tension, where you'll go back and read the Scripture. Now, I want to find where maybe the way of Jesus did include some force, because I'm not sure about that. I, I really invite that kind of homework, that kind of study. I want to do this together with you before we leave. I want to look together at a Greek word, and we never do this. I'm not a Greek scholar, but as I study the Scriptures, as I try to, to grow in my faith, I want to bring this to you, since the New Testament was written in Greek. There's this word, homothumadon, homothumadon. The word is used 12 times by Luke as he writes the story of the early church, if we read the book of Acts, 12 times. Paul uses it once in his long letter to the Christians in Rome. It's usually translated of one mind, of one accord, together, united, homothumadon. For example, when 120 Christians were gathered together, they were praying, they were waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, they were, the scripture tells us, homothumadon. They were of one accord. They were together, united. In that famous passage in Acts chapter 2, which is quoted a lot in the church, when the first Christians gathered together every day, they prayed together, they ate together, they, they did life with each other, they, they, they shared their stuff with each other, they were homothumadon. That's the word that's used there. After Peter and John were freed from jail by the angel and they returned to their friends in Acts 4 that we talked about earlier, everybody raised their voices homothubadon, united, together as one, and prayed. When everyone was bringing their sick friends and their family members together to be healed in Acts chapter 5 to this place called Solomon's Porch, the people were homothubadon. When Philip went on a mission to share the good news in Samaria, Acts chapter 8, it says the crowds listened eagerly. Homothumadon. They all came together and listened with this passion. In Acts chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem, this was a big moment in church history when the first disciples put together a policy where the converted Jews and the Greeks could be together, could stay together, could be one church. They sent their report off to the city of Antioch and they said, It has seemed good to us. Homothumadon. We are united around this. Paul, near the end of his long letter to the Christians in Rome, he prays that homothumadon, you can join with one voice, giving praise and glory to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just break it down really quick. Homo, that means same. Homo sapien, homosexual, homogeneous. Homo means same. Thuma means a strong emotion of anger. This, it's this passion. And the final syllable, don, that just makes it an adverb. That's a grammar thing. It's this middle component, component that's hard for us to translate and understand really well, thuma, which, which comes from thumas. This, it's this fiery word filled with energy. It's like flying off the handle, losing your cool, lashing out, exploding, except in the context of Christianity, in the, concept, in the context of the first Christians, it, there was no violent component to it. Nothing negative, just this burning passion. There was something burning inside those first followers of Jesus, drawing them together with something like anger without anger. Something as fiery as zealots, but without zealot violence. 
So how did the first Christians maintain this fire in the belly without getting caught up in the violence, whether it's with swords or with words? How'd they do it? I think a better question, how do we maintain our fire in the belly that comes with knowing Jesus without getting caught up in the violence, whether it's with swords or with words? The way of Jesus includes homothumadon grounded in prayer. It's the belief that God is still doing what he has always done. He's doing it here. He's doing it now in our world, in our neighborhood. It's, it's believing that God is still drawing people to himself. God is still in the business of renewing all things. And prayer, this is the application point for the teaching today. What do I do? Prayer is how we ground ourselves and not let ourselves get impatient. Why is, why is this not changing? Why is this not how it's supposed to be? Prayer is how we pursue him, homo thumadon, together. Prayer is how we ground ourselves in the what God wants us to do every day and in the how God wants us to do it. What are you saying to me today, God? What do you want me to do about it? Prayer is the way we feel and the way we follow Jesus. Prayer is not something we add to our lives. I know many of us, we pray right before we eat, we pray right before we go to bed. Those are good things. I do that too. I teach my family to do that. But prayer is more than that. Prayer is bigger than that. Prayer is the way we feel Jesus. Prayer is the way we follow Jesus. Prayer is this simple, needy language we learn as a new, immature Christian. And prayer is the intimate, familiar, developing language we use as we grow up to follow Jesus. Prayer is what grounds us in homothumadon. Think about it this way. Judas followed Jesus all over the place, but it never got inside him. He lived for himself right up to the end. Peter followed Jesus everywhere, but there was still that moment in the garden when he just briefly turned into a zealot and swung that sword like the best of them. Prayer is the way we, we get not just the feeling inside us, but the following of Jesus inside us. And real quick, I know I mentioned it earlier, but that's where this 21 days, I think, could be a great start for you and for me and for us in the new year. Because I know we're, we're on social media. I know we're listening to different newscasts and getting our, getting our information from somebody or somewhere. What if for 21 days, first and foremost, we are getting it all from him? We're grounding ourselves in how he sees the people around us in what he wants this to, to us to do that day, and what he wants us to do this new year, what he wants us to do as we navigate this next part, this next chapter of this crazy season we're in. The first prayer recorded after the church came into being, we read about in Acts chapter 4. This will be a great place to land this morning. Peter and John had just been let out of prison by Caiaphas. I want to read this from the message because I love how this brings it to life for us. Chapter 4. Four of Acts, starting in verse 23. As soon as Peter and John were let go, they went to their friends and they told them what the high priests and religious leaders had said. And hearing the report, they lifted their voices in a wonderful homothumadon, wonderful harmony in prayer. Strong God, you made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. Listen to this prayer they prayed. Strong God, you made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. By the Holy Spirit, you spoke through the mouth of your servant and our father, David. Why the big noise, nations? Why the mean plots, peoples? Earth's leaders push for position. Potentates, I had to look that word up, by the way. That means kings or queens, monarchs. Potentates meet for summit talks. The God deniers, the Messiah defiers. For in fact, they did meet. Herod and Pontius Pilate with nations and peoples, even Israel itself, met in this very city to plot against your holy son Jesus, the one you made Messiah, to carry out the plans you long ago set in motion. There's a theme to this prayer. God, you are, you are in charge. You rule. And, and I love that we get a, a glimpse of the Trinity. It's something we don't talk maybe a whole lot about, but there's this understanding from Scripture that there's one God in three persons. It's mind-blowing, right? I can't, I can't put words to it. You can't put words to it. It's, it's very difficult to understand. It's the mystery of who God is revealed in the Scripture. You can tell a lot about what people believe by listening to them pray, right? You hear somebody pray to a tree, you know what they believe, right? 
They never pray. You know what they believe. They send their thoughts to people. You know what they believe. We don't send our prayers to people, by the way. We pray to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray to the God who is real, who is personal, who is active. We, we can tell a lot about what people believe by listening to them pray. Look back at these, these lines from this prayer. Our understanding of the Trinity is revealed here. Back to verse 24. It says, strong God, you made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. This is God the Father, God the Creator. Strong God, you're in charge. This, this confidence we can get, this humility at the same time we can get by praying this prayer. Strong God, you made everything. By the Holy Spirit, you spoke through the mouth of your servant and our father, David. God, you spoke back in the day through David by the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, the one you made Messiah, all the action is centered around the person of Jesus. This is actually a really big deal. The first Christians were praying what they believed, and their prayers formed our understanding, along with some other places in Scripture, of, of the Trinity, the relational, personal aspect of God. He is personal as Father. He is personal as Son. He is personal as Holy Spirit. He's never impersonal like a force or an influence or an idea or a cause. In fact, no, we can never depersonalize God. If we're grounded in prayer, God will keep us personally connected and personally participating in all he's doing. And then look how they finish the prayer. Acts chapter 4. Now they're at it again. Take care of their threats, God. And give us, give your servants fearless confidence in preaching your message. As you stretch out your hand to us in healings and miracles and wonders done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So what do we pray? What do we pray for? What, what do we ask for? We ask for fearless confidence in preaching your message. That's it. Constantly clearly pointing people to him who is good, who is real, who's in charge. Middle of a pandemic, fear, anxiety all around us of, of an unknown future, polarizing political opinions, maybe even the temptation for some of us to become downright zealous. What do we pray for? Fearless confidence in preaching your message, pointing people to you. Trusting that God's going to do what? As you stretch out your hands to us in healings and miracles and wonders. Like the first Christians, we can refuse the violence with words and the violence with actions. I think the words apply to a lot more to us, don't they? That's prevalent all around us. It is all around us. We are in an age of outrage. And I'm a part of it. You're a part of it. We can resist. We can refuse the violence of words. We can choose the way of Jesus, choosing to trust him and follow him, following the one who's really in charge, which I think may be the main thing I'm walking away with in my own readings and my own preparation here. I think the main thing I'm walking away with when I look at the way of Josephus, this brilliant, charming, ambitious, accomplished very self-serving opportunist. Man, I can identify with him different parts of my life, and it's still appealing to me in some ways. But when I compare that to the way of Jesus, the real, the real takeaway for me is that if God is in charge, then I'm not. I want to think about that more over the Christmas holidays. It even reframes my understanding of Christmas, of Jesus Revealing who God is. If God is in charge, then I'm not. It's a very freeing conception. It's a very, it's a very empowering thing to really think about. And it enables me to trust him, to tell people to trust him, and to step into this life with him, this experience with him, to, to serve him and to love him back. If God's in charge, then I'm not. Let's pray together. Father, uh, I don't know how valuable these history lessons have been to some, but I just thank you for the way you're stretching me, growing me up a little bit more. Time and time again, when I see people whose lives you have changed and I compare them to who they used to be or I compare them to other people that don't know you, 
you just grow my faith. You double it, you triple it, because you are so good. You're so real. Thank you for the way I can pause and remember who I was without you, who I was before you, and the way that you just spur me on to trust you more. Suffering or no suffering, confusion or no confusion, you are good, you are holy, you are in charge. And one more time I declare I am not, and I need you, and I depend on you, and I trust you. Father, for anyone in our, our little sphere of influence here at Colonial, right now listening online, right now here in the room with us, Lord, that you would just woo to yourself, that you would humble to a place of surrender, that they would give you the throne of their life. Uh, we celebrate that right now, Father. If they would say the words, I give up, if they would say the words, I'm going to dive in, I'm going to choose to trust you, would you make that their spiritual birthday today, Father? We trust you, Holy Spirit, to do all the hard work to help them take these first steps. Would you help us with, help, us help them? Would you, would you give them the courage to reach out to us today to connect with one of our people standing up front here, to, to, today to, to reach out through our app? just to hit that connect button and take a reach, Father, a leap of faith. Would you, would you give us the blessing of being able to celebrate with them and take those baby steps this Christmas season with them, Father, please? We love you. I speak for our people. We love you. We, we continue to be your wayward children. Thank you for the way you woo us back. You speak the hard words we need to hear. You speak the gentle words we need. Thank you for your arms being wide open all the time. We love you. We need you. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus.